And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Let's talk about mankind's patience, all right? You know, it's, there's, there's an old saying, what is it? Let me see. Uh, patience is a virtue, possess it if you can, seldom found in women and never found in men. <laughs> you know? I think I memorized that right, didn't I? Something like that, okay. Um, patience is something that's hard to come by, but patience connects us with knowledge, wisdom, and how much we can learn if you just kind of hold back and observe many times. When it's time for action, action, yes, of course. But there is a time also when we have to be patient. Many times, um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to compare man's patience with God's, all right? I think we lose I think we lose all the way around, but maybe it's good for us to take a look at it. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to take some examples. The word most often translated as uh, patience or long-suffering in the Greek is makrothomia. And it, it means to be long-spirited, I like that, to be long-spirited, forbearing, and long-suffering. And that word is translated by most of those words into the English in the King James Version. Long-suffering, patience, and, and, uh, and even forgiveness on an occasion or two. Um, so, with, with that having been said, Jesus has just told us that we must forgive Forty times, seven, well, let's go to the scripture here. Chapter 18, let's pick it up if we may with verse 21 to gather the thought I was trying to say leading into this. Christ's teaching. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? You know, we can get kind of impatient with kin folks, especially brothers and sisters and so forth. And, and that shouldn't be. Okay, it really shouldn't be. Uh, we are to stand together, spiritually speaking, to be long-spirited, all right? Verse 22, Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. That is, you know, but still we come to that one place. That is if they repent, okay? It is not, you're not obligated if somebody has offended you and they haven't repented, only in your own heart do you say, Father, forgive them. Okay. But for the word, there go I, perhaps, or something of that nature. But uh, you are not required to be a welcoming mat for everybody to walk on that offends you and doesn't repent. All right? That's... Um, that's like um, as someone that would listen to a fool. A fool runs over you, and you go to the fool and apologize to him. Um, anyone that listens to a fool is a bigger fool than they are, whether they're Christian or not. Okay, So you've got to use a little common sense and know... Christ wants you to forgive, but penance comes, repentance comes first. The penance is simply the love from the heart saying, I, I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. Okay. Anyway, then he sets the stage giving patience and long suffering. And it's going to be compared. Well, we'll just, let's just take it. 23. Therefore, the, is the kingdom of heaven like unto, unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. Now what I want you to absorb, this is exactly the way it is in heaven. And naturally the certain king is Almighty God. All right? That's, that's who's the king in heaven. All right, got it? Don't, so don't saw around the bushes or anything. This is, this is the way that this operates in heaven. Okay, 24. And when he had begun to reckon... 
Now that's to check the books. One was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. That, that's a bunch, all right? 750 ounces of silver it would have been at the time of the writing. That's a bunch. Verse 25. But for much, for as much as uh, he had not to pay, he didn't have it. His Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Now inasmuch as we're talking about heaven, understand this, God expects you to be honest. If you owe something, you owe it. All right, And that's what he's talking about here. The Lord's in you've you got to pay it. You've got to make it right. Now watch, many might say, well, that sounds a little hard. Well, that's the way God is. Why? That's just. That's fair. If you owe something, you owe it. Period. All right? No need to beat around the bushes. That's the way it is. Um, and verse 26, The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him. This word... Um, Worshipped uh, means it sought him, but it also means repentance. I mean, he, he absolutely uh, was getting on his knees and saying, Lord, forgive me. I mean, forgive me all the way, all right? Saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And it was coming from his heart because you don't con God. God knows when you're being honest or if you're faking him, you might as well go burn a bush somewhere for all the good it's going to do you. You're not going anywhere, all right? It's, uh, you don't ever make the mistake of trying to make promises to God by conning Him. It won't work because He knows what you're thinking, all right? That's, it's very silly for someone to try to put one over on the Father. Always be honest with Him. But, I mean, what did He do here? He repented. I mean, he was sorry. He was, he was asking Almighty God to forgive him. Now, what was the subject leading into this? Forgiveness. Christ said um, uh, seven times uh, uh, 70, if it requires it. If the person really repents, you're to forgive. And uh, that in itself takes patience. But that's the way God wants it done, and that's the way you should do it. If, if the repentance is there, okay? Um, and he, he's, he's going to make it good. That's what he's saying. Verse 27, Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. I mean, just said, hey, let's just... Liner through. Now you all know that when we sin, and that sin goes in the book of life, it's right there by your name. But the moment you repent, it's erased. It is gone. It is forgiven. That's the way it's done in heaven. Okay. Just want to throw that in as we're moving by here. That's the way it operates. Christ paid the price. That, um, that we have that opportunity. What this man did is he appeals to Yahweh, our Heavenly Father's unsurpassable readiness of, of uh, generosity and uh, forgiving grace. Grace is what? It's favor. God wants to favor us, mankind. And Lord only knows we need it, okay? Just being all, I don't know any of us that are perfect. And sooner or later, we all fall short. And uh, don't, you know, you, um, again, be honest with God. Let Him know that. Let Him know when you fall short, that you're sorry, when, at the point that you are. And then comes that unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. But he gives it unmerited because of the price Christ paid on the cross. That it's washed white. It's erased. So he forgave everything. 750 ounces of silver. 
You don't owe me a penny. I, I appreciate the fact that no doubt God would say you didn't want to lose your family and you repented to try to keep your family together rather than me splitting them up. And I appreciate that. So um, he uh, forgave the debt. Verse 28. Th this was man. Man is always anxious to appeal to God's grace. I mean, just we expect it from him to the point that sometimes uh, I almost feel he must think we take advantage of him. You know, because, but, but he's our father and he loves us. So don't ever hold back from repentance. That's why Christ said seven times 70 if it takes it, if you're honest. Verse 28, but the same servant, now this is mankind here, the same servant, and remember this is the way it is in heaven also, went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. I mean, I mean, that's a pittance. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. I mean, get it on. Now, I mean, here he was just a day before on his knees before Almighty God, begging with repentance. And he goes over to one of his servants and grabs him by the throat over a hundred pence. And... Um, the, a penny, a pence. What is it? It's an eighth part of. It's a, an eighth part of an ounce. Uh, that's not much. Okay. I mean, we're talking pittance here. Twenty-nine. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, "Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all." I mean, he. He fell before him. He said, I'll make it good. Give me an opportunity. He repented. 30. This is what did mankind do? And he would not. But went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. I mean, he said, you just get on in there till I get the whole bunch. So mankind will do you kind of bad sometimes. You might as well get set for it. God won't. That's why you should hold God so precious in your heart. And, and hey, after all, you might say, well, but man's here. Well, God is too. And there's a big difference. God's in control. And he can square a man away in a hurry if you have the faith to know that. Okay? Period. Verse 31. So when his fellow servants saw that what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Don't worry, he knew it already, all right. But they're letting you know how the people felt about it when they saw this uh, unjust person. I mean, there he had been put on cloud nine with salvation, freedom, and then he does this guy that owes him just a few pieces of copper. 32. Then said his Lord, after that he had called him, I mean, he sent for him right away, and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desiredest me. You repented. You shed tears even. 33. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant? Even as I had pity on thee, should, don't you believe in doing what is just? Verse 34, and his Lord was wroth, he's angry. Our father was. This, hey, this is the way it is in the kingdom. And God's the king. And delivered him to the tormentors, the jailers, till he should pay all that was due unto him. I mean, he threw him in the clink, even after he had already forgiven him once. But it was retracted because of his feelings toward his, toward his father, fellow man. 35, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. That is to say, when they repent. Okay. Um, 
that, that is, um, in, in other words, the whole thing is based on repentance of worshiping God, repenting and asking that forgiveness, and so it should be with mankind. So when someone does re repent, then you, God knows their heart. You're kind of put on the spot. You've got to discern for yourself whether they are or not. But I kind of always like to use the old thing, fool me once and shame on you, but fool me twice and shame on me. Okay. This is why some people think when they are forgiven, that it should be dropped by the wayside and never thought of. Well, it shouldn't be brought up. But trust and credibility comes from time of proving yourself to your friends. I mean, uh, a Christian is going to give you an opportunity. But that doesn't mean they're going to just really take you right back in. And, and put a great deal of responsibility on you until you can prove you can handle it. You got it? That's the way you do it in your own life so you don't get bit. Okay. Everybody earns their reputation and your name is your reputation. Your name is that that's written in the book of life. Your name is either good or it's bad. Or it's somewhere in between. And always protect it. I mean, polish it. I, I don't literally mean to do that. But what I mean is, take care of your name. If, if you promise something, your, your whole value is placed on that. Well, I, I, I just had a bad day when I promised that to you, and now I'm changing my mind. Well, you're no good. Just get on out of here. Can't depend on you. Don't ever deal with somebody you can't depend on. Well, that doesn't sound very Christian. No, it is Christian. It's smart. That's why God put the old boy in the jug. Okay? Because you couldn't depend on him. He was, should have learned the lesson when God gave him, forgave him 750 ounces of silver. You know, that's quite a bit of silver even today, much less back then. And then he would lay hands on that poor little old guy that owed a few pieces of copper, you know, and he didn't learn any lesson. And out of our own mouths, God convicts us. That's what you do. He, he knows, okay? And it's how you operate that he rewards and judges you. Um, it's, it is well to be wise in the ways of the world and, and to know how the street operates so that uh, you know how to help people that are there. But it's the wisdom from God that brings his blessings. So there we have man going to our Heavenly Father with his unsurpassable generosity. And saying, child, I'll forgive you. I love you. And then kind of slamming him in the face with man's own way of doing things. You want to think about that. It's very important. But at the same time, having and knowing discernment that uh, you go by the law of forgiveness, and that is after repentance. Turn, let's, let's go on over, if we may, to the book of Romans. And take another little example of this, of mankind's um, patience. It, it is impatience and not having long suffering that made the old boy attack the guy. Okay? Didn't have any patience. And if there's any one thing God expects us to have, is to have long suffering. In other words, uh, let's, just, let's just cut right back to the program here, God's plan of the day. God's got a lot of children He won't save. You may not like them, and you may not want a whole lot to do with them, but God's got to give those, chance and, uh, those children an opportunity to be saved just like you are. And the strange thing is, He expects you to help. Okay? 
So there, therefore, he wants you to have patience to know we have to let time and God's will run until all souls are born of women that are, that are and have the opportunity that you have today to either accept God or not. That's your choice, okay? Chapter two, the great book of Romans, let's take it, we'll go ahead and take it from verse one. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest dost the same things. We're not judges, God is the judge. Okay, you're to practice discernment, but um, uh, do you, I suppose the reason God doesn't want us to judge others, you don't know what you're talking about, okay, in most cases, we don't. Well, uh, I heard said, that's what will get you in trouble, friend, what you heard said, okay, that ain't necessarily so, All right. and that's why you can put yourself in God's uh, corner po um, eight ball pocket, I don't know if that's right or not, whatever. Bad side of God is to listen to gossip and start judging people. Hey, if you haven't seen something with your own two little peepers, you want to be careful what you say, okay? So that, that's what he's talking about here, okay? Verse two, but we are sure, or we know, that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. In other words, God knows what's in their heart and their mind, and He knows everything we do. He's, he's qualified, got it? We're not, okay? Verse three, and thinkest thou this, O man that judgeth them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Ain't no, there's no way, okay? God is the judge. This is why we have so many people that commit crimes and think they got away with it. Hey, their main trial is yet to come. Okay. And it's before the Father. He's got it on in the book. Okay. It is written. And that's why repentance is a beautiful thing. Okay. Verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, our fathers, that is to say, and forbearance and long suffering. Our fathers got it. I'm sorry, we lose the race, okay? Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. In other words, when you know our Father and his plan, you can't help but repent of your sins and be forgiven. Why wouldn't you want to be, you know? He, he paid an awesome price. It's paid in full. It was expensive. It cost him his life. So why wouldn't you want to repent and have his blessings in your life, being long-suffering and understanding and praying in the will of God and letting God be God rather than to try to be God yourself? That will get you in big trouble, and that's called lack of patience. Okay. I want it now. That's kind of mankind's style, you know. It doesn't, it doesn't always happen that way. Verse 5, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, that means a non-repenting heart, treasureth up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. In other words, you're not going to understand his revelation. He's going to try to reveal stuff to you. You're not going to get it if you are um, unrepentant of um, our, our mistakes. And hey, we all make them. That's no big deal, all right? Well, sometimes it could be, but we better consider them so. But repent. That's the thing. It's bad if you hang on to it. Don't, don't, um, you know something? Everybody has about one day of the, I don't know if I want to use this analogy or not. Yeah, I, I, I think it came from the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure I like it now that I think about it. Everybody has about one day, in most families, has one day of the week, and guess what? That's wash day, okay? And everybody gathers all their dirty underwear and their dirty socks and clothes, and they put them in the hampers, and they lead them all down to the washer room. Um, and you always make sure you clean your hamper out, don't you? 
some people seem to want to leave their dirty socks in their hamper forever and ever and ever. And man, they get pretty bad, you know. And, 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 and that's what not repenting will do. To, why would you want to hang on to it? You know, when he's ready, he's saying, I love you. I understand how you fell in that trap. And I forgive you if you'll worship me and repent and do it now. Quicker the better. And that's what we should do. That's, that's loving our Father. And uh, he, he's saying here, listen to me. Do it my way. I love you. Be repentant. And if you'll, if you'll just listen to me, it will bring you to repentance back in verse 4. Okay, verse uh, 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds? Why? God's judge. And those deeds that are on the book by your name that are not repented for, uh, what did it say? He was, he's going to render every man according to his deeds, what you've done. Uh, I'm hoping that you've planted a lot of seeds and you've repented and all those dirty socks are in the laundry. And there's nothing there by your name other than good words. And the Lord says, my good and faithful servant, you come on into the kingdom, you're a rich man or woman. Okay, and, and, and spiritually speaking. Because God, God loves his people. And he, but he will never give you more than you can take care of. Okay? That's just the way it is. Uh, verse 7 to complete here. To them who by patience, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing, Seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. That's the way you get it. That's what this is all about. You know, the eternity is going to be so wonderful. The eternity is going to be so complete that um, we will have planted all the seeds and brought all the souls into the house of God that's possible. And those that we just could not or that God could not, even though through His long suffering, are simply going to be removed where there's no heartaches anymore. And people that bring heartaches just won't be with us. All right, That's the way it is. That's the way God operates. Uh, and it's going to be a wonderful place. There's not going to be any tears there. And there's not going to be any sorrow. And you know, that'll really be something. To be with our Father and to never have a question that you can't get answered because He'll be right there. And if you wondered about what's going on over here or there in space or what have you or how this came to be, you can ask Him. He's going to let you know. And um, I, I will say this no, I won't. Um, all things, when you have reached that place, are so simple, are so simple that you wonder why in the world we ever struggled with it here, okay? And that's a fact, all right? So, here again we see man's uh, long-suffering compared to God. And it doesn't look too good, but there our Father is always there, understanding with His hand outstretched. But the main thing you don't want to do is to let the Kenites throw those pillows, as it's written in Ezekiel 13, over the outreached hands of Almighty God, and you miss the trip. When they try to teach you, as it's written there, to fly for your soul for salvation. God said, I'm against that stuff. Don't like it, don't want it. So uh, he's got his hands out to you. Do you know why? He loves you. God loves His children. And that's why He's so magnificent. Look the way they smirk at Him in the world today. Man, I'm telling you, it'd be like me taking on my old bed the sheet and just taking, whew, flop that thing, you know. And, and I mean clean the world out. But He's so patient because He loves you. He loves our people. And you know, I don't guess there's any one of you that have children. 
that you wouldn't go over to about the same ends for them. And that makes it a lot easier to understand what you do for your kids. And our Father is like that. And He patiently teaches and says, just whoa-haw a minute. Take a deep breath. Relax. And think about your surroundings and what it is you can do for me. I have something I need. I need my children brought to me. What can you do? Okay? And God uses people in many different ways. Let's turn on to the ninth chapter of uh, the book of Romans. This ninth chapter is where God lets you know how much he is in control. He said there was two little ones in their mother's womb. One of them named Jacob and one of them named Esau. And uh, this ninth chapter of Romans. He said, I, I love Jacob. He said, I hated Esau. While they were still in their mother's womb. So God creates people with a destiny. Certain people. God's election. And uh, this is why it is written in the, the eighth chapter preceding this ninth chapter of Romans. I foreknew you. He said, you didn't even know what to pray for. But inasmuch as you're one of my saints, I will, I will intercede in your life because you are justified. And of course, that, um, that you find in the 30th verse of the preceding chapter. God is kind of saying, I have certain people I use. But it is, um, it is verse 29 where he says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, meaning to help his Son, the only begotten, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. That means judged. All right? So that kind of puts you on a, another footing there. Okay, so I'm just kind of setting the stage here because we, we're, I, I still want to only pick the part up here of long-suffering, okay? That God's going to deal with your life and you've got to have patience with God also, All right? He, he has, if He chooses you, if you're one of his elect, now if somebody has free will, he will, he will uh, change your life when you ask him to and not until then. But if you're one of his elect, I, I guarantee you, he will, you'll, want, you'll wake up and wonder why you ended up at some place someday if he wants you in another place. All right, That's the way he operates. Verse 21, um, he's talking about God now creating man as the potter. Verse 21 Ah, let's pick it with 20. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? God, why, why did you make me this way? Now, all of you know that's kind of a foolish thing to say. Verse 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Of the same lump, same lump of what? Clay. To make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. I can, uh, let me translate it for you in a better way. I can take one lump, this same lump, and I can make a flower vase here and you can put pretty flowers in it. Or I can make a chamber pot out of the same lump. That's my business is what God is saying. How much do you love Him? How much do you trust Him? Well, I just like to have things my way. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. You know, if you're a servant of God, you'll do it His way. All right? And you'll pray much about it. So, uh, what God wants you to know, it's not good to order with the, uh, argue with the potter if you're just a chunk of clay because you know what He can do with that chunk? Do you know what He can do with that vase in His hand if He doesn't like it? Kapowie. Okay? Vases break easy. Don't argue with God. Okay. Verse 22. What if God, willing, 
I repeat, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endureth with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. What if he has some vessels of wrath that he intends to destroy? He's talking about the Nephilim here, all right? Yeah, he created them. He created their souls. Okay? They weren't made with clay. And they're fitted for destruction, as it's written in Jude, verses 1 through 6. They're going to get it. What, what you, you're going to not understand this if you don't realize God says, I've got a plan for my children, and I have certain things to educate them with. Got it? Okay. 23, And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he hath afore prepared unto glory, fit up in advance. You've got to think of both free will and destiny within this, all right? Election. Verse 24, Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, from among everyone, he calls and gets his elect back on board. Um, Verse 25, as he saith also in Osi, that's to say Hosea in the Hebrew. Do you know what Hosea means in the Hebrew tongue? It means salvation. Okay, that's the subject. He's, as he saith in Osea, I will call them my people. That is Emmy in the Hebrew, which were not my people, lo Emmy. And her beloved, that's Ruhama which was not beloved, which is to say, lo ruhama. When you read the book of Hosea, you'll understand what he's talking about, okay? Because it will not be, it'll only be transliterated, not translated for you necessarily. God wrote the book of Hosea, or had Hosea to write it, because he told Hosea to go marry a harlot, because the ten tribes had gone north, and had disobeyed God, but he said, they're still my people, and I'm going to drag them out of there. But especially his elect of the final generation, he would utilize them. Why then should we think of long-suffering? You better be patient with him. And many might say, well, I wish the end was tomorrow. Well, that'd be kind of selfish, wouldn't it? Do you know how many people are yet to be born that wouldn't even have a chance at salvation if you got your way? Why don't you love God enough to know he knows what he's doing and let him alone in his time and his place? We're getting close. He's given us signs. But let God be God. Let your father be judge. And you be his servant. And you will do just fine because he likes to prosper his children. And he likes to use them. And you might say, well, he hadn't used me yet. It's not time. The witness comes after the false Messiah appears. Are you ready? That's your hour. My word. And then to stand. And let the whole world know our Father loves us. That, that uh, He pulls His people. Well, who are His people? The people that love Him. That repent. That follow Him. That want to be blessed of Him. You see, even Satan, God created his soul. All children are God's children. All souls are God's children. And as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, I own all souls. You can't give him your soul. He's already got you, friend, signed and delivered. All right? To do with as the potter chooses. <laughs> okay? But he's always, always fair. But that's what he said in Hosea. Verse uh, 26. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, lo, I may, they shall be called the children of the living God, Emmy. 
And uh, there you have it. That's God's promise. Do you know something? You can count on it. That's how it's going to come to pass. Hosea is one of the most beautiful of the minor prophets. And, of course, a lot of people don't understand because the first thing he does is tell him to go marry a harlot. And that's not understood. And all it means is, is they don't know who they are. You know, they just soon call themselves the children of the false messiah as they would the true. They don't know the difference. And uh, there you have it. That being the deeper teaching in the book of Hosea, which means salvation, which is God's love for his children to bring them to that point of salvation. And we're just about to get there. I've got two places I want to go. Go with me to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. And let's pick it up with verse uh, 12. And let's remember our thought. Man's kind's patience compared to Almighty God's patience. And you might even add the will of God for mankind. Okay. Verse 12 of chapter 3, the great book of Colossians. Put on therefore as the elect of God. I don't know, are you? Holy and beloved bowels that mean, of mercies. That means a heart or mind of mercies. Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. You might as well get hornest up for it, friend. Don't get anxious. If you love God, you want it to be done His way. Okay. You know why? Because that's exactly the way it's going to be done. Now, if you're going to get in the hornest and help Him, He's going to bless you. If you're not going to help him, he is not going to bless you, period. That's just the way it is. Well, but, but, but I love him. Well, what good are you? Okay. You know, he's got to have somebody he can use. If it's nothing but simply to let him know you love him, you're doing a great thing because that's why he created man. He does not want... He does not want blood sacrifices or anything else. And I'm quoting from that same book of Hosea, O.C., that we say that we just read of. Chapter 6, verse 6, he said, I don't want your burnt offerings or those burnt animals. I want your love. And that's what he does want from you. Okay? So set your heart and mind. If it's the plan of God, it's your plan. Verse 13, forbearing one another... Or bear with one another. Hey, and I know it's hard. It is, it is really hard to bear with some people. Especially me. <laughs> you know, I, I just simply say that. So let's be sure and include all of us, okay? It's, you know, people can be, I, I'm sorry, we're, you may be surprised. We're not perfect. You know, we got faults. And uh, I figure... I figure, you know, when, when I first became a pastor, I said, Lord, what are you sending these to me for? You know, why? And then he gave me a real good talking to one day, and he said, because you need them. I thought, whoa. You know, I need somebody like that. Yeah, it'll mature you. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll make you a good pastor. <laughs> They will test your okra. <laughs> uh, anyway, look at that in life. You know, all of you have got one kinfolk that good Lord help you. You know, the whole family hate to see them coming. When they see their car coming down the road, they lock the doors if they can. You know, but sometimes it's too late. He's caught you. Okay. But, but you're supposed to have that one. Okay. It's, it'll, everybody should have at least one nitpicker. And it'll do good for you. All right. Um, maybe some of you don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know, but be that as it may. 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I want to, I want to, uh, you know what I'm about to say. If they've repented to you, you should forgive them. What happens if they don't repent? Then you know something? 
except for God, there you go. You'd be just like that. So don't go to that person and say you forgive them necessarily. But in your own heart and mind, say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that way you can turn loose of it and it won't tear you up. Okay? So you, you don't want it to tear you up. Don't let somebody that wrongs you tear you up. If they're not worth it. Okay? So simply, simply just know that by the grace of God I'd be ignorant also. And let it go. You know? But be, be, should I bring it in again? Only a fool will listen to a fool and let it happen to him twice. Okay? Or thrice. Uh, Use good judgment and discernment, all right, and, and stick with it. Okay, um, verse 14. Is that where we were? Yeah. Uh, and above all, this means most important, uh, above all these things, put on charity. You know what that is? That's love, which is the bond of perfectness, perfectness. It is. Love is the strongest force in the world. Do you know that kings go to war in the history and take over a whole country and lose thousands of men? And when they win, they go into the other king's treasure and take his pretties and goes home and guess who he gives them to? Mama. Because okay. yep. he loves her. Puts all the pretties on Mama. And Mama didn't even fight. Okay. She stayed home. So love is one of the strongest forces in the world, all right? and, and, and it will pay dividends for you. And I'm not necessarily talking about husband and wife love. I mean love for mankind. Four, 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. God is not the author of confusion, okay? To the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. And you are, if you're in a body that knows and understands that. There is only one body, and that's the body of Christ. You know, he, he is our everything. God sent him to pay the price that we, we can and have it for our sins to own repentance, be forgiven, and allow you to come into long suffering. Um, and... It is, it is natural that uh, when you grow older, you gain patience because you're not in a hurry to go anywhere, okay? But, but for the young, you need to practice patience. It's a wonderful thing. And um, sometimes uh, people, older people, and this is not true, they say, wonder why youth is wasted on the young? <laughs> but, uh, but it's... We're all the same age anyway, all right? So learn patience. And the main thing is, how, how do you gain patience? By listening to God, wanting Him to control in your life so that you receive blessings instead of heartaches. Um, and 16, let the, Lord of, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts uh, to the Lord. And so it is. God wants to be in your family. He wants to lead your family. In closing, turn with me to the book of Second Peter. Second Peter is, uh, chapter 3 is written to a bunch of people that say, it ain't going to happen. The world's not going to end. It's going on just the same as it is now. It's always been that way. And it isn't going to change. And you've you got a lot of people out there that way. That's why it shows their ignorance of the Word of God and they can't read the prophecies concerning the end time. Do you know that the nation Israel formed in 1948, that that has never happened since Christ walked the streets of Jerusalem? That's it. That's the first time. And he said, that will be the last generation. That's pretty easy to understand. And that proves that the Bible is true. And that lets you know and understand why you're coming into that time. And um, uh, that's what the first part of this uh, chapter 3 kind of says. He said, don't listen to them. They're a little bit foolish. And um, 
verse, I want to pick it up with verse 9. This is your father, and don't ever forget it. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He promised the end is coming. You can count on it. Don't listen to somebody that would tell you it's going to continue on the same. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is God's wish, but he's not going to force anybody to. Okay? Now you've got to understand your father. If they will not repent on their own to love him, he doesn't want them. Okay? And that's what it will ultimately come down to in the millennium. All right. But it, um, the point I want you to derive from this is God doesn't get up every morning and say, I I'm going to go out there and find me somebody to zap. Because there's nobody he wants to zap. He's already sentenced Satan to death. And the Nephilim along with him. They're held in, in bondage for destruction when God's wrath spills over. Why? Because they've already been sentenced and they earn what they got. But for, for everyone else, right up to the last day, it is His will that they come to repentance. Why? That brings forgiveness and that brings salvation for them. And His children are saved. He's in the business of saving His children. And not killing them. Or not zapping them. Or not making life miserable for them. But correcting them when they need it. Especially if they're God's elect. He's got a big stick to correct them. All right, Verse 10. But the day of the Lord, which we would have, if we would have started a verse earlier, we would have learned the day of the Lord is a thousand years long to man. It's a millennium. Um, will come as a thief in the night, and in the which the heavens which pass away, the heavens uh, pass away, shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements, that's staunchy on in the Greek, and it means rudiments, it means bad stuff. All the bad stuff shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. In other words, there's not going to be anything bad left. It didn't say it's going to burn up the good. Got it? This earth is going to be our home. It's going to be cleansed. That's what he's talking about. The heat that does this is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, what effect does it have upon your life? It warms your heart. But to someone that isn't with him at that time, it will exhaust them. All right. Verse 11, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversations and godliness? Well, patient. Okay. Long-suffering. Wanting to please God. Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements, again the rudiments, shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And that is that third heaven age, that is that third earth age. It's not a different heaven, it's not a different earth. But it's going to be cleansed. This earth is going to be different. And there's not going to be anything to offend. But God still loves His children. And it is, he, he doesn't love what they're doing, a lot of them. But it is His will that they come to repentance. And that's why He uses you, is that they have that truth. Mankind's patience and uh, related to our Heavenly Father's, no match whatsoever. Our Father is so patient with us that you can always count on Him. And do you know something else? As it is written in the 13th chapter of the he book, great book of Hebrews, He will never leave you nor forsake you. As long as you want Him, He's with you. That's His promise. And do you know something? Man may let a promise slip. God won't. Not when you're deserving. God keeps His promises. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Father, for the Word. Thank You, Father, for being with us. 
May these all be a blessing in whom they come in contact with, Father, carrying thy word forward. We ask it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the Scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter, and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.